We'll pray and then we'll get into Revelation chapter 19, try to finish up this chapter here uh, tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day and for your blessings. We ask God that you would help us now, Father, as we uh, get into the Word of God, as we try to study it, for the Holy Spirit of God would guide us, direct us, illuminate us, and instruct us. We pray, God, that you would uh, bless our request, uh, our prayer request, Lord, that we put up before thee this evening. We pray, God, for the salvation of souls. We pray, God, for... Uh, Lord, the healing of those that are sick. We pray, God, for those who, Lord, are backslidden and need to get back in the way. We pray, God, you might help us, Lord, to stay true to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Revelation chapter 19, verse number 17. Now, of course, this is the second advent of Christ. And uh, when we talk about the second coming of Christ, uh, we refer to the rapture and we refer to um, the revelation of Christ. Uh, the revelation of Christ is when he comes at the end of the tribulation period. The uh, rapture is when he comes at the beginning of the tribulation period, before it begins. Um, and so when we talk about the second advent, we say it's in two phases. Uh, there is the rapture of the church, and then there's the second advent proper, which means that is the real one. Uh, the first advent of Christ, uh, he shows up uh, uh, and he's born and he lives his life, and then he dies on the cross. Uh, the first advent is when he's born. And uh, he lives and he suffers and he dies and resurrects. That's the first advent. Uh, the second advent is when Jesus Christ literally returns back to the earth in Revelation chapter 19. But the rapture is part of the second coming, uh, but it's not the actual second coming in the sense of what you're reading about in Revelation 19 when he comes back to the earth uh, to take over and set up his kingdom. Uh, so you got to keep those two things in mind. So the two parts of the second coming are the, revel the rapture and the revelation some seven years later. Um, and so verse 11 to 16 is the second advent, and then verse 17 is part of it as well. And I saw an angel, verse 17, standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, uh, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Now, when he talks about the, the, the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, uh, he's referring there to the heaven in the sense of the atmosphere above us here. Um, and, of course, that's where we're caught up uh, to meet the Lord in the air in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the rapture. Uh, the air there is a reference to the atmosphere. Um, and then you have uh, in Ephesians chapter... Um, can't think of the verse right now, but it talks about, uh, uh, I guess it's Ephesians chapter 2, where the devil is the prince of the power of the what? The air. That's the atmosphere we live in. Okay? What did the devil say back in the book of Job, chapter 1 and 2? And the uh, Lord asked him, what have you been doing, Satan? He said, I've been walking to and fro in the earth. And so the earth is his domain. The Bible said the whole world lieth in wickedness, 1 John 5, 19. And so the whole world lies in the clutches of the devil, really. Um, and um, then uh, the air above us, the atmosphere, is also his domain as well. And that gets into electronics and all kinds of things. Um, technical difficulties, you know, when you're trying to broadcast the gospel and things like that. Uh, there may be something to that as well. Uh, may, it may also involve UFOs. Um, uh, unidentified flying objects and things like that that are, uh, in my opinion, I believe they're real. Um, the Air Force believes they're real. Uh, the government believes they're real. They probably know they're real. The question is, what's their origin? What's their motivation? And uh, their origin is satanic, demonic, and it may not even be from outer space for all we know. But anyway, um, some people laugh at that and stuff, but uh, I I'm of the opinion they do exist. And... Um, what do you do if you come across one? You rebuke them in Jesus' name. That's what you do. You, you, you let them know about Christ. Amen. Hey, where are you from? Have you heard about Christ? Amen. He died for the whole world. But you're not from this world, so I don't know if it, you're included. I don't know. But anyway, it gets into a lot of things there. But he said, verse 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of, the, of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. And uh, we looked at one verse in Matthew 24. Look over at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. 
And uh, it is a parallel passage to uh, something that we read in Matthew chapter 24. But in Luke chapter 17, he says this in verse number um, 37. And, and the context is uh, the coming of the Son of Man in these previous verses. It's talking about the second coming of Christ. And uh, it's, part of it is, uh, you're familiar with it, uh, verse number 35, two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. So we know we're talking about, uh, uh, some people apply that to the rapture, some people apply that to the tribulation period itself where people are dying. But look at verse 37. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? Where is this stuff going to take place? Where and when? Uh, verse 30, 26, he's talking about, As in the days of Noah shall, shall, shall the Son of Man be coming. Uh, uh, verse 28, when the Lord comes back, it's going to be as in the days of Lot. Verse number 28. Uh, so if you look, if you study the, uh, the days of Noah preceding the flood, if you study uh, the days of Lot preceding the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, you see what the world is going to be like before Jesus comes back. And I think you can see it now um, just by watching the news now. Uh, but anyway, verse 37, They answered and said to him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, these are the corpses that are dying in the tribulation period, particularly at the end of the tribulation period, thither or there will the eagles be gathered together. And so the context of that is Armageddon. And the context of Armageddon is Revelation 19, verse 11, Christ returning the second advent, and then verse 17, the battle of Armageddon is going to be described here. So he says, Come and gather yourselves together into the supper of the great God. In other words, there's going to be a lot of, for lack of a better word, corpses lying around, rotting in the sun. And the vultures and the eagles and all the uh, predatory birds and the scavengers are going to be having a feast that day. Verse 18, that you may eat, here it is, the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Now when you really think about that, that is a very gruesome and grotesque description you just read there. I mean, it doesn't come across that unless you really think about what's happening there. Uh, if they put that in a movie, which they have, it'd probably be R-rated because of violence and gore. If you really think about what you're reading there. And so when some people say, you know, we need to get the Bible out because it's, you know, we need to censor the Bible because it's too violent, it's too graphic and things like that, you can read that and you don't really get it unless you seriously think about what you're reading. But um, anyway, people are getting used to those things by the things they watch on television nowadays. Uh, verse 19, And I saw the beast... Uh, the beast, of course, is the one back there in Revelation chapter 13. Um, and uh, this is the beast that is the, known as the Antichrist. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. So there's the kings of the earth. There were ten of them back in Revelation 17 that supported the beast. Uh, this may be a reference to those ten kings, or it may be a reference to all the kings of the earth. But, you know, particularly, it's the kings of the earth that back the Antichrist, the ten of them in Revelation 17, uh, and I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies uh, gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So look at verse 11. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says there that they, made, they, they, they were going to make war with uh, the one on the horse and against his army. Look here at verse number 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now think about this thing about heaven. We mentioned a while ago in verse number 17. The midst of heaven there is uh, uh, the elevation where birds fly. It's in the midst of heaven. The first heaven, there's three heavens. There's the first heaven, which is the atmosphere. There's the second heaven, which is outside of our atmosphere. And that's the solar system and uh, the universe. And then the third heaven is uh, God's throne room. There's only three of them. There's no seventh heaven. Uh, the Mormons believe that there's, I believe, seven levels of heaven or seven heavens or something like that. But uh, there are only three in the Bible that's mentioned. 
And so in verse 17, in the midst of the heaven, that is at a certain altitude there, the birds are flying around. And uh, here you have verse um, 14. Think about this for a second. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Now, uh, are these the armies which were in God's throne room and that part of heaven? Uh, is it the universe part or is it up here, someplace in the clouds? Where is it? Uh, when the Lord comes back, he will be seen. He will be seen. And the armies that follow him will be, they're literal, so they're going to be seen coming in and coming out of the sky someplace over Israel, over the Mideast. Um, something like it has never been before. Uh, they're going to think it's an invasion from outer space. Um, and then it says, uh, so he made war against uh, the one that sounded the horse, Jesus Christ, and against his army. Uh, that's the church uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 20, And the beast was taken, there's the Antichrist, and with him the false prophet, there's that other beast in Revelation 17, the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image. Uh, these both, that is, the beast and the false prophet. The first beast in Revelation 13 is the Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet. And so here are those, here's the, here's the Antichrist, here's the Antichrist public relations man, if you will. And these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And that's the end of it. It doesn't tell us much about the battle there. But we do know in some places, what we read is that the, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to slay the wicked with the breath of his mouth. And it's going to be the Spirit of God coming out and the Word of God coming out of his mouth. He's going to slay him with his words, is what he's going to do. Um, and they will be slain to the point of verse 17 and 18, where again, it is a slaughter of those who went against Christ. Um, verse um, 21, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. The remnant would be... Well, look at verse number uh, 19. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies. So no doubt the remnant that are slain here would be the armies that are gathered together to attack Christ upon his return. Uh, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. What sword is that? It's the sword which proceeds out of his mouth, the word of God. And all the fowls are filled with their flesh. So he just speaks the word. And the, the universe comes into existence. He speaks the word, and the battle of Armageddon is over with very quickly. Um, now, uh, and it says, and it says, that then uh, all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Going back to verse 17 and 18 again. Uh, if you look at Ezekiel 39, I believe it is. Look at Ezekiel chapter, I think it's 39. Look at Ezekiel 39 here. Uh, you've got Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and I think it's Ezekiel 39. I, I believe this is it, yeah. Um, look at Ezekiel 39. Yeah, verse 17. We're going to get down to that in just a second, right, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, look at yeah, Look at verse 17. So you know the context here, right? Uh, verse 17. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come. Gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of goats, of bullocks, and all them, uh, all the fatlings of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you be full, and drink blood till you be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Uh, and we will stop there. But uh, verse 21 says, All the heathen shall see my judgment. Verse 22 says, The house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, and why? Because he comes back. Now look at this thing. This is what I wanted to show you before we close. Look at verse 6. I'll send fire on Magog, and they shall know that I am the Lord, he says in verse 6. Um, look what he says in verse 8. Behold, it is come and it is done, saith the Lord. 
This is the day whereof I have spoken. And that's the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is the tribulation period. And the day of the Lord, uh, in a sense of a literal single day, would be the day he comes back at the second end. Um, verse 9, And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire for seven years. That is, uh, they're going to take seven years after the tribulation period is over with, going into the millennium, I suppose, to dispose of all the weapons that are left over from um, the uh, from the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, verse 10, So that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoil them, and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord. Uh, now look at verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that, that day that I will give unto God a place there of graves in Israel. So the Lord's going to come back to Israel. The armies will be there to meet him, and they're going to die there in the mountains of Israel. Um, and I will give unto God a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. And it shall stop the nose. He talked about, he's talking here about passengers on the east of the sea. Is that ships? I don't know. Maybe it's a train. I don't know. But look at this thing here. He said it shall stop. So whatever this thing is that, it says it shall stop the noses of the passengers. So who the passengers are on the ships or possibly prophetically maybe a train going down through there or driving their cars or who knows what. Uh, apparently they're going up and down the, 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 the country of Israel here and they're driving by somehow riding by somehow, it says that it shall stop the noses of the passengers. What is that? He's talking about the stench. The stench of all the bodies that are left over at Armageddon. And there they shall bury Gog and all his multitude. And they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. Uh, look at verse 12. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them. It's going to take seven months to bury the bodies. That, the, that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord. And they shall sever out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search. And the passengers that pass through the land, when any seeth a man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamon Gog. Uh, so it says there that they're going to be burying it for seven months after the tribulation period into the millennium and that they'll have to, verse 14, they'll have to get some men that can be fully employed in doing this. And uh, they're going to cleanse the land by doing that. And uh, when they see a bone or a dead body, they'll put a sign by it and mark it saying, here's, some, here's, here's one that needs to be buried. It's going to be like that over there. And um, that's a very gruesome, graphic picture of what's going to take place there. Uh, if you're saved, you won't be among that number. But if you're lost at that time and you've rebelled against God and rejected Christ, you're going to stand with the Antichrist. And you're going to be in the armies of the Antichrist. And uh, now what about around the world? There's still going to be people around the world that won't be affected by this particular battle here. But they will be affected in the sense that once that battle is over with, uh, they're going to have to submit to Jesus Christ as Lord and, and Master and King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And they'll get the word over the news broadcasts from CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and all that other kind of stuff. They're going to be out there and they're going to hear, you know, who won the battle. Then they're going to show it. And then Jesus Christ himself will go and sit on the throne of his father David in Israel, in Jerusalem, and declare himself ruler of the world at that time. And uh, that's what we're looking forward to. Amen. Okay, okay we're going to stop in there tonight. Father, heavenly, thank you, Lord, for this day, for your blessings. We ask God that you might bless your, the study of your word. Help us, God, to realize, uh, Father, uh, what the, the future holds according to the Bible. Help us, Father, to uh, be able to, Lord, read the signs of the times and understand them. Help us, Lord, to be able to help others understand them as well, uh, that uh, souls might get saved, trust Christ as their Savior, and that Christians might, uh, Father, wake up 
and uh, Lord, uh, live for you as they ought to. Help us all here tonight to do those things pleasing to you and help us all to be good uh, uh, spreaders of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. 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 We're dismissed. And God's people said real loud. Amen. 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 Good night, y'all.